you're a Ford fan, or even just a fan of a Ford Mustang, you're probably sitting at your screen right now and thinking to yourself, this car shouldn't be called a Mustang. And you're right, it shouldn't be called a Mustang. The Ford Mustang Mach-E is a four-door electric SUV, not a two-door sports car. But in this video, I want to ignore that and just have a look at the car itself. Look at it on its merits. Is it a good car? Does it make a good electric car? Has it got plenty of space of your family? Um, and just look at it as an actual car and disregard the actual name. The model in question for today's video is actually the top of the range model. This is the GT. Twin motors, so one at the front, one at the back. 91 kilowatt battery, and it develops 358 kilowatt and a mind-boggling 860 newton meters. So it's pretty quick. Zero to 100 is 3.7 seconds. Claimed range is 490 kilometers. So a lot of it stacks up. But at $115,000, does it make good sense? Or should you spend a little bit less money and get one of the lower grade models and still get a lot of the same experience? Well, let's have a look around the car in this video and take it for a drive. And I'll explain some of the differences between this GT model and some of the lower models in the rest of the range. But yeah, when we take it for a drive, that's where you see the big difference in this GT model. So grab yourself a tea or a coffee, and for the next 15 or 20 minutes, let's have a look at this Ford Mustang Mach-E GT. Right, now as I said, this is actually the GT version of the Mach-E. Um, and first off, I actually think it's a good looking car. Uh, I do love things like these upgraded 20 inch uh, alloy wheels with the Brembo brake calipers. Um, they do fill the wheel arches a little bit better, sort of the guards looking a little bit more sort of pumped up. Uh, the front styling is also revised over the sort of lower grade models as well. Uh, a bit more aggressive styling on the front. Uh, and we've got these sort of air ducts here down the sides so that just kind of fills out the body a little bit more. Uh, full LED headlights, front and rear sensors. We've also got the side sensors so it can park itself. Uh, coming a little bit further around, uh, the badging on there says Mackie 4X, so that denotes that it's four wheel drive. Um, obviously, there's one electric motor on the front and one on the back. Uh, that develops the 358 kilowatt and 860 newton meters of torque, uh, as we mentioned before. Um, and if you've never driven an electric car, you'd be very surprised at how quickly this thing gathers pace. You might have driven a V8 Mustang, and you think that's pretty quick, but this thing would actually destroy a V8 Mustang by quite a bit. It would leave it in its dust. Um, even if you put it in the quiet mode, uh, what they call whisper, which is like the economy mode, if you like, it is still damn quick. Um, you put it in untamed and um, yeah, that's a different beast altogether. Um, something we'll uh, look at when we're driving the car. Other bits and pieces you get, the same sort of push button here on the door to actually open the car. Uh, same in the back, you've got the little handle here on the front, which we'll have a look at in a second. Um, but yeah, the overall styling of the car, I think it looks a really good car. Um, probably take that pony off the front and it might even look a little bit better uh, in some people's eyes. Um, why did Ford do it? I think they just want to sort of use the Mustang name because everyone loves the Mustang. Um, and now we're sort of going into the future with electric cars. But I don't necessarily think Mustang is, is the right name to give this car. Sure, call it the Mach-E, because that kind of you know, alludes to the fact that it's you know, something a little bit special. But yeah, to a lot of people, and even to myself, a Mustang is a two-door sports coupe with a V8. And that's where I think they should have left it. It's a bit like when Holden took a front-wheel drive European hatchback and called it a Commodore, when in fact it was an Opel Insignia. Um, if they had to call it a Holden Insignia, people probably would have bought it a lot more. Um, but for too many people, Commodore is a rear-wheel drive V6 or V8, and that's where they should have left it. Anyway, let's have a look a bit more about this car and some of the features and benefits. When you come around to the back of the car, there's also signs that Ford are trying to carry over uh, the Mustang heritage as well. Uh, you've got the tri-bar LED rear lights, which obviously you get on the, uh, the two-door coupe as well. Uh, the GT badging there in the middle. Um, obviously, we don't get any exhaust on the back because it's an electric car. But yeah, you can definitely see where Ford are trying to sort of carry that theme over from the Mustang um, sort of coupe. Um, the boot itself is actually not a bad size, just over 400 litres, um, which you can obviously expand quite a bit if you fold the rear seats down. 
So when you're looking at spending $115,000 on an electric SUV, there's actually quite a lot of choice out there now. Not only this Mac-E GT, you've obviously got the Tesla Model Y, you've got a Genesis GV60, his cousin, the Hyundai Ioniq 5, but then you've also got things like Lexus, BMW, Mercedes. There's actually quite a lot of choice out there now. Would you buy this or would you buy one of the others? Let me know in the comments below because I'd love to know what you think. Anyway, let's have a look at the inside of this car now and see how this GT is different to the other models in the range. Right, let's go and jump inside the Mach-E GT. Uh, you've got the your normal push button here on the side of the door uh, and also the little door handles. And if you can just see there, you've got the buttons there. So you can do the feature where you can actually lock your bits and pieces inside the car and go down the beach swimming or whatever. Now first impressions of this interior, it's not actually dissimilar to the lower models in the range. There's a few bits and pieces that are slightly different. Uh, so we've got this nice sort of suede effect finish here on the doors. Um, the material there which covers uh, the B&O speaker is exactly the same as you get in the base model. Um, good if you're buying the base model, I guess. The seats are very, very different though. They're actually sort of really supportive and comfortable. Lots of bolstering down here and on the sides, uh, but also up here on this sort of shoulder section as well. So they really do hold you in. Uh, so great if you're gonna go for a bit of a spirited drive on some twisty roads. Uh, fully electric, as you can see down there. Uh, you've then got the memory button there on the driver's door. Uh, and then jumping inside, we actually get a very similar cabin uh, and layout to even the base model, to be fair, because uh, they've all got the sort of same setup. But if I just shut the door, let's jump in. Uh, there you go, there's that badge on the steering wheel. Uh, we do get the nice feature where, as soon as you press the start button, the seat moves into place at your last saved position. Uh, then you've got the digital display there in front of the driver. And if we push the button, it brings things to life. So let me just get rid of that little warning there. So the display in front of the driver is actually quite basic. Uh, as you can see, the left hand side there, we've got 43% of battery life left, which is 177 kilometers worth of range. To the right hand side, you've got your digital speedo, uh, and then obviously then down the side, what gear you're in. Uh, speed time recognition is just there. And then on the top there, that's your lane keeping aid, and the blue section uh, is for your uh, adaptive cruise control and autonomous braking. Um, other bits and pieces we've got, you've got your standard stuff like obviously uh, how many kilometers your car's done, how many seat belts are plugged in, uh, your lane keeping aid. Uh, when it says ready, it's means it's ready to drive basically. The handbrake is on, and I'm currently using the one pedal driving uh, feature, uh, which I actually prefer uh, rather than sort of, you know, the traditional sort of using your braking accelerator. It gives actually a much smoother driving experience. Then we come over here into the middle of the dash and we've got the 15.5 inch infotainment screen. As you can see, we currently got built in sat nav. Uh, we've also got wireless Apple CarPlay and wireless Android Auto. Uh, so you've got all the usual sort of suspects there. Down the bottom, uh, you've got the buttons in there for the climate control. It's all touch screen, uh, but it's fairly easy to use. We've even got, if we go into the settings, some unique functions for the Mac-E. Uh, so we've got here the three different driving modes, so Whisper, Active and Untame. Uh, Untame is a bit of a riot, if I'm honest. Um, the one pedal driving that I mentioned a moment ago, We've got propulsion sound, so it gives you a bit of sound as you're driving along, uh, and the auto hold function for the electric handbrake. So there's a few different bits and pieces there for the driving modes. At the top, we also got a button there to undo the front uh, storage area or the front, uh, then also a button there for the rear tailgate. Uh, the button there in the middle would allow you to unlock the charging cable from when you actually charge the car, uh, so then you can obviously take the cable uh, and then drive off. So that's the infotainment screen. The rest of the interior is actually similar to the base model. You get the material across here on the top of the dash, uh, the trims that go from one side of the dashboard to the other, they are slightly different on the GT. Uh, and then you get this suede feature here, which is the same as what you get over there on the doors. The seats, as mentioned earlier, are very different. They're suede and leather, uh, and actually very, very comfortable. I do like the seats. Uh, down the bottom, underneath the infotainment screen, we've got the wireless charging pad there, uh, just on the left, and a bit of storage down the right-hand side. 
uh, and also as you can see up there a couple of USB charging ports. We've then got a couple of cup holders um, just there I had a cup of tea a minute ago so that's a nice one there to store your drinks and your bottles in. We've got the rotary dial selector there for your gears, uh, nice and easy to use. The park assist button there for the active park assist and your hazards and then the electronic, electronic handbrake. So nothing too sort of technical there. Got a nice armrest there with the GT logo uh, stitched into there. Uh, plus also some nice stitching around the edge of that armrest which is quite nice. Uh, that lifts up and then we've got this little door that slides open for a bit of extra storage. Uh, so that's actually quite deep so you can get quite a lot of stuff in there. Um, so that's quite handy as well. Uh, we've then also got the same large panoramic glass roof as you get in the base model and the mid-range model. Uh, there's no actual internal blind on that, but it has got a special coating, so in the summer uh, the heat doesn't sort of build up too much inside the cabin, uh, so it's actually quite a clever idea. Oh. Getting in the back of the Mackie GT is pretty easy. You do have to duck your head a little bit because the sloping rear roof line obviously can catch you out if you're not too careful. Um, headroom is actually pretty decent. A lot of cars when they have sunroofs you tend to lose a little bit of space but actually this is quite good. Legroom is really really good. There's actually acres back here. Um, I can't quite get my feet under the driver's seat which is a bit disappointing. Um, but you can stretch your legs out far enough so on a long journey you're not going to get uncomfortable. In the middle here we've got air vents plus a couple of USB uh, charging points for mobile devices as well. Uh, we've got a couple of sort of door bins down here, they're not particularly deep um, so you won't want to sort of put anything sort of too big down there. You've got the usual fold down armrest here with a couple of cup holders which is obviously quite handy. Um, ISO fixed child mounting points uh, on either outer seat, so pretty standard stuff really, there's nothing exceptional back here it's just a nice place to be um, the leather and the suede carry over from obviously the front seats um, so yeah it's pretty decent in terms of the view um, the windows aren't particularly big but it lets enough light in you get heaps of light coming in obviously from the roof overhead uh, and the view ahead is pretty decent too so all in all not a bad place to be in the back of this Mac EGT right so we're on the road let's take this Mac EGT out for a drive and see what we think Oh, the suspension is firm in this car, even though it's got a Ford's Magnaride system, which adapts the suspension thousands of times a second, it is actually pretty firm. And if you live in Melbourne, you know how bad the roads are here, so if you hit a pothole or just get a bit of road that's not particularly smooth, you certainly know about it. One of the nice things about driving this car is you're not going to see too many on the road. It's not like a Tesla where you see hundreds and thousands of them on the road. It's a very exclusive club because, yeah, they're not sort of sold in such big numbers as like a Tesla Model 3 or a Model Y. So you do gain entry to sort of quite an exclusive club when you buy one of these. And in the few days I've been driving this, I've actually spent most of my time in the whisper mode which in sort of normal car speak is economy which is very unlike me because normally I put it in like the mid-range sort of normal mode if you like um, or even in the sports mode and the reason I've put it in the whisper mode is it's got enough performance in that mode as it is you don't necessarily have to have it in active or untamed to get a decent level of performance out of this car it's pretty darn quick anyway So then it kind of begs the question, if you're not going to use the untamed mode very often, would you be better off just buying the premium, which is the long range model, which will give you the maximum amount of range in a Mach-E? Because people still are, you know, wary of sort of like range anxiety and things like that. So yeah, and you can save yourself sort of $20,000 or thereabouts by getting the premium version. Sure, you don't get the fancy wheels or the Brembo brakes, all these lovely comfortable leather and suede seats but is that worth twenty thousand dollars i'm not so sure if i'm honest if it was me buying an electric car my big thing is obviously the range 
because, you know, although the network in Australia is getting a lot better than it used to be, there's still a bit of room for improvement. As an actual thing to drive though, the Mac E is actually really, really nice. I think Ford kind of do it a disservice by calling it a Mustang because that's all people concentrate on. It's comfortable, it's quiet, it's got a great specification. It's a nice thing to drive and it's, it's just a nice car. But if they drop the Mustang name, I reckon they'll actually find more owners. And one thing I have noticed in the last few days of driving this car is actually how much attention it actually sort of gets. I've seen people in you know Teslas and other cars driving past and doing a double take and actually having a look at it. I guess because you don't see them everywhere. But yeah, there's, def there's definitely a bit of interest out there about this car. Whether that's because of its name, people want to see what it looks like. Uh, just a general sort of curiosity, really. Another nice thing about driving the Mackie is the fact that it doesn't shout it's an electric car. It definitely looks slightly different than your average sort of SUV, but it doesn't shout electric like a Tesla Model Y. And that's some of the appeal to this car, I reckon. In terms of the interior, I really like these leather and suede sport seats. I love all the light you get coming in from the sunroof. I like the use of materials on the door, like the suede, and the material on top of the dash as well. It does feel quite premium inside. But you can get that same experience on the lower models as well. They still get the sunroof, they still get the nice materials on the dash. You only gain things like the nice leather and suede sport seats and the bit of suede on the door. Um, so yeah, you've got to question, is it worth paying the extra money to get the GT model over something like the premium, which you still get all those features and also a slightly longer range. You don't get the performance that you get in the GT, but as I said a minute ago, I spent most of my time driving this car in whisper mode, so it's not like I'm using the extra performance um, that you get in the Untamed. So there you have it then. That is my review of the Ford Mustang Mach-E GT. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. If you've got any questions or comments, obviously leave them down below in the comment section for me. Uh, I'd love to know your thoughts on this car, name aside. Um, would you buy one or would you buy something else for $115,000? Um, so yeah, thanks for watching the video. Hope you've enjoyed it. Um, give it a like, share it with your friends, subscribe to the channel and also hit the notification bell. Just leaves me to say thanks for watching and look forward to seeing you all in the next one.